Do you believe you found the skeleton? How would you tell people that this happened? You first, first, first. How would you tell us? Well, interesting question. I don't know. I don't know. I'm research this. Hey there YouTube, the Dapper Dinosaur here. You might notice that I look a little different. That's because this video was a special request from one of my supporters, Space Dragon. So today, I'm a dragon in honor of that request. And no, I didn't make the dragon, I bought it for like $450 US. That's $4.50. Anyway, this video was response to a video by Kurt Wise of Answers in Genesis, who's going to stand in front of a computer monitor set up in the AIG lab for kids and tell us about the paleontology of Noah's Flood. It's going to be exactly as accurate and intelligent as you're thinking. Let's see how far into the series we go before we have to question whether Wise is simply ignorant and incompetent or actually intentionally dishonest. Take it away, Kurt. We're going to look at the paleontology of the flood. Paleontology is a science. Uh, however, uh, with a science, we should start with scripture. Right out of the gate with one of the stupidest statements one can make. Reality came before the Bible. The Bible would not exist if reality were sufficiently different. Reality is prior to the Bible, and it is the standard by which it and your interpretations of it need to be tested. If reality, as judged on its own terms, tells you that the Bible is wrong, then either the Bible is wrong or your interpretation of it is wrong. I'm sorry if that contradicts your deeply held beliefs, but that's simply the only way to go about it that won't leave you with no reason to think you're right and to be almost certainly wrong. Science is not in the business of starting with conclusions. If you do that, you're doing pseudoscience. And if you're caught doing that while working on a degree, it is grounds for disciplinary action. Yet when we look at scripture, we find very little explicitly in the Bible about fossils and uh, their formation. By very little explicitly, he means nothing at all. The Bible doesn't talk about paleontology for two simple reasons. One, the people who wrote it had no understanding of the concept of fossils. And two, even if they did, they were writing their myths and their legendary history, polemics against their rivals and oppressors, and warnings to each other to remain faithful to their own beliefs and identity. Where in that is there time for someone to dig up a Spinosaurus or something? We find a little bit about the Flood in the, in the Bible, a few chapters uh, devoted to it. A few chapters that don't say anything about fossilization. But there's little in that description that directly applies to fossils. We have reference to the breakup of the fountains of the Great Deep at the beginning of the Flood. Ah yes, the fountains in the ocean that God normally keeps plugged up like a bathtub drain, lest the infinite waters that surround the flat earth rush in, not needing to displace air, because the writers of the Bible didn't know that air was physical matter that couldn't be infinitely compressed. I hope we hear about the floodgates of heaven, which are doors in the dome of the flat earth that let in the same waters, but from above. We have the fountains of uh, the great deep. We have the windows of heaven. There it is. Uh, we have the fact that the flood is a global flood over the entire earth. It's covering the mountains for... Uh, for at least part of that time, and it lasts for more than a year. It killed all the land animals and humans, but again, no explicit mention of paleontology. In fact, among the land animals, the Bible says it killed the creeping things, which is primarily terrestrial invertebrates, which is odd since Answers in Genesis explicitly excludes them from riding on the ark, so kind of a big contradiction, and a lack of taking the Bible literally from these biblical literalists. So we're going to have to learn about our flood paleontology from the fossils themselves. What a concept, learning about the physical world by studying the things in it, rather than just assuming that your favorite interpretation of your favorite book is the absolute truth. All the while keeping in mind as we're studying them that we can't forget the Bible. We've got to keep going back and checking to make sure that what we're postulating about fossils is in fact consistent with the biblical account. And then he ruins it. There is no reason to go back and check the Bible. If you want to believe the Bible, you should go back after you've reached all your evidence-based conclusions and then read what you find there in light of the much more certain physical evidence. If your intuitive interpretation of the Bible doesn't line up with reality, then it's the wrong interpretation. And if no interpretation you find reasonable lines up, then the Bible is wrong about that at least. Deal with it. Our first question we might have is, is, is it possible that perhaps the fossils were created by God in the beginning. Okay, I know young earth creationists are bad at almost everything as a rule, but to be fair to them, they usually reject the old chestnut that God or Satan created the fossils to test your faith. So I fully expect Dr. Wise to reject this idea. The problem is that some of the fossils are in fact animal fossils, and thus they are direct evidence of animal death. 
I mean, I would have said the problem is that it allows an omnipotent divine liar in the door, which means you literally can't ever know anything about anything, because there's a very distinct possibility you're being flawlessly lied to by God. But, okay, sure, let's go with, that might make you think there was death before the fall. In our understanding of scripture, we have uh, the introduction of nephesh death, or death of nephesh life, animals, uh, only coming with the flood, it's uh, with the fall. Yes, in your understanding, which is not the only honest way to read the text, or the way most people read it. If you want to say there was no death before the fall, you're going to have to actually find evidence of that, not simply assume it at the outset, and then force all the data to fit into that narrative, and ignore the rest. And it's then unlikely that God would have created in the original creation evidence of death in the original creation that wasn't going to be introduced into the world until after the fall. I think we need a citation for that. But I love that even here, when Wise could go the smart route with fake fossils would mean there is no possibility for a coherent epistemology, instead he goes with, I don't think God would give a preview of the fall in the geology of the earth. Creationist, you're allowed to not give the worst take imaginable on all things. I know some of you know this, like Sal Cordova or Peter from Paleologos or Rebecca from Bread of Life, but most of them seem hell-bent on consistently using the worst arguments, even when better ones are right there and don't contradict young earth creationism. So I think we're forced to conclude, at least that when we're looking at the fossils of animals, that we have to be looking at a time after the creation. If they were created, then no matter what's going on with the fall, it would have to be after the creation, since by definition, things can't be created before they're created. Maybe he just misspoke and meant after the fall. That would at least make sense internal to his logic. So which fossils of those that were formed after the creation, the animal fossils, were formed in the flood, or are any of them formed in the flood? And now we need evidence of a flood. And the thing is, a global flood isn't the kind of thing you have to go argue about or scratch around in the rocks to try to find traces of evidence. It would be glaringly obvious across any part of the world that wasn't eroding rapidly. Flood deposits aren't subtle. They erase ichnofossils and bioturbation. They heavily grade bedding. They result in fossil assemblages that are jumbles of various ecosystems, etc. If there had been a massive global flood, there'd be a gigantic deposit with those characteristics everywhere on Earth where it hadn't been removed by erosion. It would be far more obvious than the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary at the end of the age of the dinosaurs. Instead, it just doesn't exist, and Wise, along with his colleagues like Snelling and Austin, just pretend that the rocks of the Mesozoic and Paleozoic, which in their geology are no different from the rocks under or above them, are flood rocks, for literally no reason other than that they say that some of the rocks are flood rocks. And since those have a lot of fossils, and the flood would have produced fossils, those are a convenient group of rocks for them. Let's look at the major features of Earth's fossils to answer that particular question. We look at the biostratigraphic column, that is a... At this point, he launches into a very slow and boring description of the term biostratigraphic column. I'll do it faster and while wearing a top hat. It's a chart showing the various layers, or strata, of the Earth's rock with the organisms found in those noted on the chart, especially index fossils, which are used to indicate where in the column particular fossil-bearing rocks are from. In the lower part of the biostratigraphic column, even in some places tens of thousands of feet, we have rocks, but we do not have animal fossils. In fact, we don't have plant fossils. We don't have any fossils of any macroorganisms at all. The only fossils we find in this lowest portion of the fossil record are bacteria. Remember how floods characteristically wash multiple ecosystems together into the same deposit? Well, they also tend to sort fossils by side. So if there's a flood deposit, the bacteria should be at the top, not the bottom. And this is just basic hydrodynamics. Small things stay suspended in the water column longer, because forces like bulk fluid flow and Brownian motion are more likely to overcome gravity if the particulate in question is light. This is the... Most of the Precambrian, with the exception of the very uppermost Precambrian, uh, which has got a few more organisms in it, there are no animals for most of the Precambrian. True, which is kind of a problem since those rocks include, as admitted by Wise himself, sedimentary deposits with fossils. That means the whole communities of bacteria had time to grow, die, be buried by sediments, and for those sediments to lithify, all in evidently normal conditions and all before the flood, and all without a single plant dropping a leaf or some pollen. This seems. Well, Farfetch doesn't really cover it. How about Off the Wall's Bonkers Insane? Still a bit mild for this idea, but oh well, my words have failed me. Above that point, once we start getting um, uh, especially animal fossils, uh, 
we have a biostratigraphic column that has been built from primarily marine organisms. Most of the fossils on the planet are in fact of marine, shallow marine organisms, as a matter of fact. Yep. In the past, as now, shallow marine environments are reasonably stable, unlike deep marine environments which tend to be subducted. Also, the shallow seawater is where the largest extent of deposition occurs, as sediment is washed in from across continents by river systems. Uh, relatively few are, in fact, land animals or plants, that sort of thing. So this is primarily based upon the most abundant fossils, which would be marine organisms. Which tend not to be found in a single flood deposit. Weird, isn't it? From that biostratigraphic column, it's, uh, we've been able to divide the uh, organisms up into different faunas. For example, there are three major marine megafaunas. Okay, this isn't really a thing that gets to the main point he's talking about, but it's one of those things where it gives an indication he has no clue what he's talking about. Megafauna isn't a term he should be using here. Megafauna are large terrestrial animals like elephants or rhinos and such. It's not a word you can make plural. It already has the form of a plural noun. The singular word would be megafaunus, if such a word existed, but it doesn't, and instead, the word is a non-count noun, like milk. It makes just as much grammatical sense to say you have three megafaunas as it does to say you drank three milks for breakfast. Answers in Genesis is trying to overturn more or less all science, and when you're doing something like that, you need to be as careful as possible to be on point. Sloppiness like this is not becoming of a scientific rebel. Now, of course, Wise has already explicitly admitted he's not doing science because he has a conclusion in mind and won't be swayed by evidence, but he still wants to seem like he's doing science. So he shouldn't make these kinds of mistakes. What he should have said was faunal assemblages. A faunal assemblage is the animals that are present in a given place at a given stratum. And really, there are far more than three, but whatever. There is one in the lower part of the biostratigraphic column called the Cambrian uh, megafauna faunal assemblage, but no, there are many faunal assemblages in the Cambrian, because it's made up of multiple strata, both vertically and horizontally. And then there's one above it called the Paleozoic. Same thing, there are many. Megafauna. And then there is finally one marine megafauna that goes from the uh, top of the Paleozoic all the way to the present, which has been entitled the mer modern marine megafauna. I guess the whole Mesozoic is just like right now? That's why when you swim in the ocean, you have to watch out for mosasaur attacks, and why ammonite is such a popular sushi item. If you look at the terrestrial world, the terrestrial fossils, the fossils of land animals and plants and uh, aquatic animals, things that live on the land. Ah yes, the aquatic animals that live on the land. Of course. I honestly don't know how I'm supposed to take this man seriously. People misspeak. But when misspeaking is your default, maybe you just don't know what you're talking about. Uh, we find basically three megafaunas and floras in the terrestrial world. Megaflora is the same thing as megafauna, except it's for plants. It's a non-count noun referring to exceptionally large plant species. There is a, a primary, a, a, a paleozoic fauna, if you wish. It doesn't go as far down as the paleozoic fauna of the marine world. Which is weird, since floods jumble organisms. So really, there should be no identifiable assemblage beyond just the flood assemblage, especially since the flood, being a single event, would deposit a single stratum, given that that's what a stratum is, the rocks deposited by a particular depositional environment, however long that lasts and however geographically extensive it is. But nonetheless ends at about the same point in the stratigraphic column. There is a secondary uh, land fauna flora uh, that uh, corresponds to uh, it is in between the Paleozoic and the modern, and then there is a modern fauna. If we look at that modern fauna, the rocks that represent that modern fauna, we also have uh, in that, that particular zone a uh, increasingly modern fossils. Oh, the kind of thing you'd expect if evolution were true? Neato. As a matter of fact, again, referring to marine organisms, they uh, subdivided the, this upper portion of the f column according to how many, mo how many of the fossils we find in that rock are in fact modern. I should have asked this before, but what do we mean by modern here? In the historical sense, that's from about the 16th century onward. In art history, it's a period in the 19th and 20th centuries. Do we mean percentage of organisms that were found in the year 1500? Is it percentage of species that are still extant? 
is it just eyeballing a thing and like maybe an extinct deer like Megaloceros looks enough like a modern deer to count? I don't know, and I doubt Kurt does either. It's percent modern species. At the very base, we have rocks with no modern species at all. As we go up the Cenozoic, we have increasing percentage of modern species. So, do no modern species exist before the flood? I honestly don't know if that's what the implication is. Also, when we look, when we expand this and look more closely at it, we find that species are found uh, from a certain depth up to a certain point. It's called the stratigraphic range of a given organism. We have overlapping stratigraphic ranges. We have organisms that seem to begin at one point in another, and another organism is, uh, is overlapping with it. There's no clear place where we can make a boundary. That's true for literally the whole column, including whatever Wise wants to put in the flood boundary. If he tries to say otherwise, trust me, I'll show he's wrong. Uh, between some event before, some event after. So this seems to be a continuous sequence. That, combined with the percent living species, uh, suggests that we have uh, no breaks in here from, uh, from any, uh, no significant breaks in sedimentation and uh, fossilization. There was no significant erosion in the Cenozoic. The Grand Canyon? Never heard of it. Scablands? What are those? But presumably he means not below the Cenozoic. And then when you look within families uh, during in this same zone, we find that there are many families that show a sequence of fossils all the way up, and in fact a, se a series of very logical family lineages. So I guess the sequence of animals like Cetacosaurus, Archaeoceratops, Leptoceratops, Protoceratops, Zuniceratops, and Triceratops just doesn't exist in the rocks. Nope, not real. That definitely doesn't show the development of things like horns and a frill or increasingly grab a portal limbs, or the increasing prominence of the premaxilla as a unique bone in this group of animals. One species not only overlapping with the next, but in fact logically transitioning from that species. There's no direct transitions, but it looks like you could line those up. It looks like those species really could have transitioned one to another. Well, you heard it here first. According to AIG's own Kurt Wise, a transitional species doesn't actually have to be the direct ancestor of a later species to count. And they are indeed good evidence for evolutionary relationships. So I guess all of these count as evidence for evolution, according to AIG. An example here from the frog family, uh, from a frog flam family, but there's many other examples that we have. Like the mammalian cogionid family that nicely spreads across the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary. Heck, among them, the members of genus Hynina managed to get from the Cretaceous to the Paleogene. I guess they missed the memo that they were supposed to die in the flood. In this column, what this suggests is that the, this upper portion of the column, which is often called the Cenozoic, uh, is in fact after the flood. It is the modern world. Except, you know, we have organisms spanning that gap, doing the same evolving below as above it. Granted, fewer of them across that particular boundary, but that's because of a gigantic space rock that slammed into Mexico. But also, as I've pointed out, we have the same kind of evolutionary sequences that Kurt says are okay in the Cenozoic in other time periods. Now granted, they're easier to find in the Cenozoic, but that's basically because by virtue of being younger, less of it has been destroyed and is higher up. So overall, we'd expect the fossil record of the Cenozoic to be better than that of the Mesozoic or the Paleozoic. It's in between 
the Cenozoic and the Precambrian then that we most logically will put the fossils of the flood. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah, maybe if we didn't have organisms spanning that alleged barrier, that might work. Sad fact is, we do. And of course, the Paleozoic and Mesozoic aren't made up of a big flood deposit. They're made up of many deposits, including lacustrine, fluvial, marine, and even aeolian. That's formed under a lake, a river, the ocean, and the air, in order for those who might not be geology nerds. In that zone, then, between the uh, upper Precambrian and the base of the Cenozoic, we have billions and billions of fossils. Oh, it's far worse. Even though creationists agree with scientists that most animals don't get fossilized, the number of fossil individuals is too high for them all to have existed in a single year. Literally, the Earth would have been covered in a sludge of algae, mollusks, insects, and not a few larger examples of macrofauna, in the correct sense. Here's a link to Dr. Joel Duff going on a deep dive about how just one group of Mesozoic cephalopods left too many fossil shells to have all lived together at the same time without filling the oceans of the world in a carpet of tentacly boys. Also, go subscribe to him. The fact that at the time of me writing this, he's not able to monetize is something we can and should fix. There's billions of organisms that were in fact uh, buried in the flood. As a matter of fact, if you look at the fossil record of the, of the flood, you find all sorts of organisms in the fossil record that you do not find in the living world. I guess God had a pretty low success rate with the ark, huh? There's a long list of these. There's a 57 classes that we have in the fossil record, but we don't have in the present world. We have 231 orders in the fossil record that we don't have in the present world. And there's even larger number of families and genera and species. Including huge numbers that never showed up in the Cenozoic, despite being on the Ark according to Answers in Genesis. And by the way, I assume that anyone working for that group agrees with their official stances unless they say otherwise. If you work for an ideological organization, it's reasonable to assume you agree with them until shown otherwise. So we're looking at uh, not only lots of fossils, but fossils of a world that was far more diverse than the present world. Ooh, question begging. Yay! In order to say that the world was more diverse in the past in terms of biology and then use basically all pre-Cenozoic fossils as a collection to demonstrate that, you have to show that they all existed at the same time. But guess what? That's what he needs to demonstrate, that they all lived at the same time. You can't assume that his conclusion about biblical history is true and then use that assumption to show it's true. That's a logical fallacy. So the flood seems to have decimated life. By decimated, I mean it had a certain diversity before the flood, and it significantly narrowed that diversity in the course of the flood. Nope, still just begging the question. This suggests that the flood was, in fact, a catastrophe. You don't need to suggest it. If there was a global flood, it was definitely a catastrophe. But assuming there was one, then interpreting all data to fit that doesn't actually demonstrate that such a flood existed. It was uh, a very unusual event that very rapidly destroyed a significant number of organisms, uh, both on the land and on the sea. I'm just waiting for all the evidence that all Mesozoic and Paleozoic strata were deposited in a single global flood. Weird how that's not forthcoming, and instead many formations are explained by low energy deposition, like the Solnhofen limestone that deposited the matrix around Archaeopteryx, or the formation where the bugs that AIG's pet paleontologist Dr. Haynes described for her own dissertation were found. So let's be real, even the young earth creationists know that that's nonsense. Another uh, characteristic of the fossils in this zone of what we're ascribing to the flood is that they're common and well-preserved. There are many fossils. Yeah, except that a violent flood carrying huge amounts of often extremely large and coarse sediments aren't really good at preserving exquisite detail. Again, as noted by Dr. Haynes in her dissertation, you know, AIG's pet paleontologist, the fine detail she was able to see in her fossil wasps was thanks to the low energy deposition that didn't mechanically destroy the wings, which is what she says in her own dissertation. And this is kind of an unusual characteristic because in the present world, it's not an easy thing to, in fact, it's not often that you can find fossils. I'm really going to need a citation on that. But of course, also by definition, if it's not more than 10,000 years old, it's not a fossil. So yeah, you can't find a fossil from three years ago because then it wouldn't be a fossil. It would just be remains. Uh, it's not easy to produce fossils. It never has been. If we played a little game and asked ourselves, 
If you wanted to be a fossil, if you were a little critter that wanted to be a fossil, what would it take to get yourself fossilized? It would be quite a process, actually. I mean, not if I live in the right place. Die somewhere where I fall into a bit of water that has deposition faster than my hard bits decay. That's not most places, but it's also not no places. You might be, if you're, again, the most common kind of fossils, a marine invertebrate fossil. So you're swimming around in the shallow marine zone. Maybe you're a cephalopod or something like that. What do you have to do or what has to happen for you to get preserved as a fossil? Die, then a small landslide. Boom. Fossilized. First thing is you've got to avoid the car carnivores, those that are out to eat you. Not many of those under a landslide, so check. Because most of the time the carnivores, when they consume you, will in fact crunch you up and you won't be able to be preserved as a fossil because there won't be much left of you. Fun fact, a carpolite is fossil dung, and in the case of dung from predators, it can contain identifiable animal remains. So even if you are eaten, it's not a guarantee that you won't be fossilized. And then, so maybe during your life, you can keep away from the carnivores. But once you die, of course, you can no longer have any choice in the matter. Well, like I said, that isn't always a problem for fossilization. But since I'm under a landslide anyway, the problem that wasn't really a problem is already solved. But you have to avoid another problem at that point. You have to avoid the scavengers. In the modern world, scavengers are very effective at destroying the bodies of dead organisms both on the land and in the sea, maybe even more especially in the sea. Good thing that all the ones that are good at quickly eating carrion are already either buried with me in the landslide or are less likely to find me under all this sediment anyway. It's now mostly up to the anaerobic bacteria, and they are very slow. The, uh, the fact is that God created organisms in such a way that there is a, there's a whole group of organisms. Their job is to eat up, consume the organisms that die or parts of organisms that die so that we don't end up in a pile of dead bodies. So, um, what were they eating before the fall when there was no death? And you can't just say something else because they were designed to be scavengers according to Wise. So scavengers, uh, the decomposers of the environment, are usually very effective at destroying bodies. Sure, when they have easy access to the bodies, they don't in all cases. But also, there are scavenge marks on fossils all the time, so even scavenging isn't a deal breaker. And also remember, you can be completely scavenged by a large predator and then get pooped out and preserved anyway. For an organism to end up being fossilized, you've got to get away from the scavengers. It helps, but it's not necessary. Uh, and probably one of the best ways to do that is to get buried or covered so that the scavengers can't see you. Oh hey, that's already taken care of. Neat. But there's another problem you have to encounter, which is the, uh, the problem of the aerobic decomposers. Fun fact, anoxic conditions exist, especially under sufficient sediment. So again, if the sedimentation rate is high enough, or just oxygen is low enough, no problem. There are, pe there are those that are running around on the surface looking for dead bodies that are sitting on the surface. And especially in the marine realm, there are organisms then that dig into the mud uh, at the bottom of the ocean at the bottom of even the of especially the shallow marine portion of the ocean and they're continually churning it up finding dead organisms at depth they will in fact decompose them i feel like i keep stealing his thunder sorry about that i uh, have referred to them as the aerobic decomposers because they dig into the mud and circulate uh, ocean water down into their burrows they're bringing oxygen into those places. These organisms require oxygen in order to do their decomposition. They're, because of that, because they have access to oxygen, their decomposition is actually usually very efficient and very effective. And so this is, this is a zone that's very, diff <laughs> it's very difficult to survive through. Again, if you want to be a fossil, you're going to be destroyed almost certainly if you end up in this zone. Good thing that zone is escapable by means that aren't just global flood. So you, how do you get out of this zone? How do, you, how do you get into a position where you can be fossilized? Best way would be to be buried far enough or deep enough that you're not only out of sight of the scavengers, but you're uh, below the depth of, o of oxygen for the aerobic decomposers. Like a normal old slump of marine muck, the kind of thing that happens all the time. Problem is aerobic decomposers usually can burrow down uh, scores of feet uh, in a very quick time can get several feet down. So you've got to be buried pretty fast 
in order to get out of this aerobic decomposition zone. Of course, if the locals were themselves killed in this slump, that's a nice little reprieve. And very few organisms, certainly in the present world, end up uh, being able to get through that zone buried deep enough, soon enough, that they can be preserved as fossils. But even when you get to that point, you've got another problem. You've got a problem with the anaerobic decomposers. There are bacteria that don't require oxygen that continue the process of decomposition. Already covered it. They're very slow, and they're equally a problem for the flood model as for real science. We're skipping that since anything he says is just an argument against himself, and arguing against him is my job. Let's say you do get buried deep enough, fast enough, that you can get out of the scavengers and the aerobic decomposers, and maybe even uh, keep ahead of the anaerobic decomposers. Once you've been made into a fossil, you've still got to avoid the process of erosion that brings your fossil back up, brings you as a fossil back up to the surface. Once again, also a problem for the flood, if it's a problem for geology. This is a wash. See what I did there? The point is that in the present world, fossilization is a rare process. It's very hard to reproduce the conditions that make fossilization optimal. Cool, but Madagascar is full of lemurs that are fossilizing right now. Lake Natron is full of all sorts of fossilizing animals. Fossilization happens now. As a consequence, you wouldn't expect the commonness of fossils that we see in the fossil record, and certainly the fact that they're extremely well preserved. Why not? The fact that most organisms won't fossilize doesn't tell us anything on its own about how many fossils we should find. This is only a problem for old ages of the Earth if we already assume a flood, which we can't because besides it already having been shown not to have happened, we haven't even begun to argue that it has. If the flood were already well evidenced, and the young age of the Earth were already well evidenced, then sure, you could argue that the abundance of fossils are a problem. But as it is, they're actually a problem for the flood, because there are far too many of them to have all been alive at one time on one planet. But if they had lived over the course of millions of years, that's a perfectly reasonable amount of time for all those fossils to exist. And I really want to drive this home. There are more fossils on Earth than living things. And by a lot. What this suggests is that there's a, a rapid burial that's occurring during the flood that is not occurring in the present world, or not commonly occurring in the present world. So then why are most fossils not found in sediment that can even be flood deposits? I mean, famously, the fighting dinosaurs are in Aeolian sandstone. They died in a sandy desert with no water to be seen. The Coconino sandstone preserves raindrops, something impossible deep under the flood which is where it would have had to have been deposited in flood geology. Which, uh, combined with this uh, evidence of catastrophe, suggests we have a catastrophe of very rapid burial during the flood. Except, no, it suggests that there have been various catastrophes at various times, because the catastrophe-type deposits are interspersed with a sedimentary column that is primarily non-catastrophic in origin. There has yet to be any conferred way to, say, deposit fine-grained non-flocculated shale in the flood. Yet the Bright Angel Shale, which is a Cambrian stratum, so it was apparently laid down in a flood, is made of fine grain non-flocculated shale. Another observation that we uh, deduce from the fossils is that the fossils have been transported a very long ways, and that they've been transported along lines of latitude. Sometimes, other times, we have fossilized root traces in fossilized soil. That can't have been transported, or the root traces would have been erased. And yet, there they are. In fact, that was found offshore in Norway, along with Norway's only dinosaur, a plateosaurid that may have actually been Plateosaurus, as reported by Johan Nistuen in his 2022 paper, A Late Triassic Dinosaur Bone, Offshore Norway. To be entirely honest, I'm telling you about this because it's a cool paper. It's linked in the description. Go read it when you're done with this video. This is, um, it's not always possible to deduce this, but in some cases it's pretty clear that this is what's happening. Yeah, like when young Earth creationist Summer Rose Weeks found that a graded bone bed was deposited in a flood in the lands formation. Of course, she also determined that the dinosaurs had to have died, laid out rotting for a long while, before a subsequent flood washed the bones into a low-lying area. So, you know, not a global flood. Which is too bad, since I don't know how she, or Arthur Chadwick, fellow young Earth creationist who was her professor, and signed off on her paper, squared this with their flood geology. You have a fossil, let's say, um, you have a coral fossil that is preserved in what was originally a carbonate mud. Well, that's a problem because corals have to, be, have to grow on solid surfaces. They're sitting in mud, they sink into the mud, and it kills them. So the fact that this coral is now 
deposited or found in what was originally mud must mean that it was carried from some other place to that location. That's not where it lived. So what you do is you follow the rock along to find out where, uh, where you got evidence of a hard surface. And you often have to trace these rocks for hundreds of miles, sometimes thousands of miles, before you ever encounter any reasonable place that such a fossil could come from. These kinds of inferences suggest over and over again that organisms in this uh, flood fossil zone have been carried huge distances to be buried where they are. Sure would have been nice if we had some examples to look at, but yeah, fossils can be carried along in both catastrophic and non-catastrophic processes. I don't know if Kurt knows this, but sometimes things fall into flowing water. And yes, sometimes there are catastrophes. But again, evidence that a catastrophe happened isn't then evidence specifically of a global flood. That catastrophes have happened isn't an issue. The question isn't how do young earth creationists explain flood deposits, it's how do they explain non-flood deposits without lying about them. And the answer is basically, well, that they don't. They've been buried rapidly, but they've also been carried a long, a long ways before they were buried. And when you start putting all the pieces together and do this for a number of different organisms, you notice that when they are buried, they're buried in the same kind of latitude you might expect them to have lived in. Like all those tropical plants and animals in the fossil record of Antarctica. Yeah, sure. For example, with coral. Coral in the present world is restricted to within about 30 degrees north and south of the equator because they have they require rather warm temperature in the water. They would like a situation where calcium carbonate is in the water and uh, ready to precipitate out. Easy for the organisms to p take out calcium carbonate and deposit shell material, uh, coral material, with it uh, from that material. So speaking of coral, this is El Capitan. A large portion of the mountain is made of the skeletons of coral. Now coral can't grow all that fast, and this represents hundreds of feet of coral. And it's in situ. It's where it grew. So how did this coral reef grow so big before the flood and then survive getting blasted by mega tsunamis and hypercanes and such? I don't think they'll really try to explain it. I've checked, and the only thing I found in the creationist literature was about the granite of the mountain, not the coral. So I don't know. Now, I'm not going to spend all my time checking, so if you know of a paper that they have written, or a video they've done, or even a blog post about El Capitan's coral, let me know. I would love to hear the explanation they give. And so, when we see f these corals that we have to trace a long distance, we still find them in this burial site that's a long ways from wherever they came from, typically within a short distance of the equator. So what we seem to see is a consistently, if you can figure this out for a given fossil, if it's evident with a given fossil what climate it's normally living in, it's very frequently, most of the time, found in the same latitude as it, was, uh, it, it should have been growing in. Therefore what? The flood was sloshing east to west? Like what conclusion do we draw from this? This suggests that there is a current that is carrying the fossils, uh, the organisms that are going to become fossils, long distances, and it's following latitude lines. When you add that together with ed evidence from sedimentology of the direction of currents, you find that these fossils have actually been uh, transported long distances along latitude lines from the east to the west, consistently across this flood fossil uh, zone. Aha! Now I know what we're talking about. This idea comes from the aforementioned Arthur Chadwick, see last episode, who along with Leonard Brand and Mingham Wang collected paleocurrent data from around the world to create what, as far as I know, is still the most extensive data set on paleocurrents that exist. And it was published in Nature. So no, creationists are not excluded from publishing in major journals when they do good work. But there's a problem. After this was published, Chadwick used the data set to argue that during what he thinks of as the flood year, and what is actually basically the Paleozoic and Mesozoic, that there was a dominant flow direction which switched from west to east a few times. But the problem is, that's just not true. Paleocurrent data in Chadwick's own dataset don't actually show an unusual consistency in the flow direction of paleocurrents. I know, because both myself and Vice Rhino have crunched these numbers before. The Nature article is linked in the description, feel free to check, 
And given that I'm pretty sure that this is where this is coming from, and that we're not given examples of fossils being significantly displaced east to west, but not north to south, I now suspect that rather than basing this claim on actual fossils, Kurt Wise may actually be just saying that this prediction that one can draw from Chadwick's wrong conclusion is just already verified, but it's not. Another observation is that footprints are found in among these fossils. Which is, on its own, a problem for these layers being flood layers. Footprints can't be made in salt rock. They have to be in some kind of unlithified sediment. But there are two problems if this is a flood. The first is that if there's a flood and the sediment is soft, then the footprints are simply erased. Just think about footprints on the beach that you may have left behind beneath the high tide mark. When the tide comes in and out, they're just gone. Tide goes in, tide goes out. Never miscommunication. You can't explain that. And that's the effect of much milder ocean waves, never mind mega tsunamis and hypercanes. The answer could simply be that the sediments had turned to rock between being made and being covered by floodwaters. But the problem here is that this process isn't instantaneous. We know how long it takes for lithification to occur because we can see it happen. We also know that chemical reactions are involved and can test those under various conditions to see how fast they can happen. There simply isn't enough time in a year for this kind of lithification to occur. So whatever we're about to hear, I'll bet it's not an explanation for how footprints could even occur under a flood. And really, I need to be clear about this. This is the kind of nonsense that a quick trip to the beach can defeat. This isn't some highbrow ivory tower theoretical work here. And uh, there's two characteristics that are common with these characteristics. First, that they're found in, or were formed in, water. Yes and no. Some were indeed formed under some depth of water. Some were formed in simply damp sediment. Water is important for the formation of tracks because it helps the sediment stick together to form a coherent and stable track. Again, going back to the beach, if you walk in the completely dry sand, you leave prints, but not ones that have a clear impression of your feet or shoes. But once you step into the damp sand, suddenly your prints are clear. But if you step into flowing water, your steps are immediately eroded by the water itself. So we do have prints from below water. In fact, we even have some preserving different swimming gates and dinosaurs. But in order for this to happen, the water has to be reasonably still, or, like at the beach, the marks will simply be washed away. And further, as I've noted before, we have tracks from the desert of the Coconino Sandstone that were definitely not made under a body of water, but rather in damp sand during a rainfall. And how do we know that? Well, because the raindrop impressions are still there. You know what happens when a raindrop hits the surface of a body of water? It just adds to the depth of the water. Not, ex not an exposed in the atmosphere. Except, you know, for the ones that were, which is most of them. Most were formed with water present, but still above water. And secondly, that the footprints are found below the body fossils. So, for example, here we've got some footprints uh, in a sandstone in the Grand Canyon. Uh, the, there's a little bit of an outline of the little guy. It's a it's basically, a, it's a labyrinthodont footprint, a type of amphibian. Uh, you've got several of them here, one, two, three, four. There's the trackway of the little fella. Uh, and the direction of trackway is indicated by those prints that I pointed out. But the individual prints are actually faced at a slightly different angle than the trackway is. So he seems to be walking kind of cockeyed to the direction of the, of the trail, uh, which suggests that there is a current of water. Water is moving along and pushing him. Or the animal was just walking uphill, which, you know, has been the consensus since at least 1979 and remains the consensus today for the very good reason that the Coconino sandstone is composed of cross-bedding of the angles characteristic of windborne sand dunes, not submarine sand dunes. The only person I'm aware of who has managed to report numbers consistent with waterborne dunes is Andrew Snelling, and no one can seem to reproduce his results. And since we already know he's willing to simply blatantly lie to people's faces, I don't trust him to not lie in his papers. And this is on top of the fact that, remember, there are preserved raindrops in the Coconino sandstone. So, yeah, we can be very confident that this animal was going up a dune, not against a current. This is probably not in wind situations. It's got to be in water. Well, I agree that it's probably not wind, but it's also not water. By the way, I'm going with the assumption that these are from the Coconino Sandstone because that's a part of the Grand Canyon that is known for lots of tracks, 
and according to the geologists I usually consult with, it looks like Coconino sandstone with some desert varnish. So it was probably exposed to the air for a while before it was found. If it turns out that that's not what it is, then I'll have to go back and reassess. But as it stands now, I'm reasonably confident that this is indeed from the Coconino. Especially since this particular animal is a very low-lying animal, so the evidence is that there must be a water current that is causing him to put his, his feet, orient his feet, uh, upstream so that he doesn't slide away, so that he isn't washed away. What would that evidence be? Because things other than currents can make animals walk with their feet pointing the direction of the force being applied. Significantly, gravity can do it. I like that we're not even seeming to bother to discuss the actual conclusion that has been reached by real scientists. And that's one of the things about AIG. They do the bare minimum to pretend to be real scientists to casual observers who don't know too much about the science they're misrepresenting. But if you dig even a little bit under the surface, you realize that they're barely a step above Eric Dubé's 100 proofs that the Earth is not a globe. 200 proofs Earth is not a spinning ball by Eric Dubé. 4. Rivers run down to sea level, finding the easiest course, north, south, east, west, and all other intermediary directions over the Earth at the same time. If Earth were truly a spinning ball, then many of these rivers would be impossibly flowing uphill. For example, the Mississippi, in its 3,000 miles, would have to ascend 11 miles before reaching the Gulf of Mexico. But that's what happens when you start with an obviously incorrect conclusion, like that the Earth is only 6,000 years old, or that the Earth is flat. You have to be either ignorant or dishonest to support those ideas. Now, I think most creationists are on the ignorant side, but I know some of them are not, because they have the education to know better. And then make his way across the current at an angle from this, we can determine the direction of current, the type of current that uh, animals have experienced. If we look at dinosaur prints, for example, we find that the quality of the dinosaur prints uh, suggests that they were formed underwater. Oh, hey, look, Paluxy tracks. At least he's not pulling a Hogan and saying that some of them are human tracks, when in fact they are actually ornithomimid tracks. And they were indeed formed under shallow water, probably in the intertidal zone of a shoreline. One hint of this is that there are preserved ripples and that the footprints clearly eroded while the sediment was still unlithified. It's also been observed for a very long time that uh, dinosaur prints seem to lack tail drags. You've got the prints of the dinosaurs, but you rarely get a drag of a tail. You know, because dinosaurs held their tail off the ground. In fact, to get the tail to contact the ground anywhere but the very tip, you generally would have to sever the spine which, you know, animals tend to avoid as a habit. I have seen a couple tra tail drags. One, the one I'm, uh, I've, I've seen actually in person in the field is, uh, is one where it's clear that the animal threw his tail down as he was falling, because then it's followed by a body print. Exactly. You only get tail drags in unusual circumstances, because dinosaurs weren't tail draggers. And we've known this for like 50 years. Usually, however, the tail is not on the ground. Uh, it's not preserved. So it either suggests that dinosaurs always kept their tails above the ground. Which they did. In fact, they have extensive ligaments going between the transverse processes to keep the tails off the ground. And most probably physically couldn't have their tails drag while standing without significant effort and rearing up so that the spine was near vertical rather than the horizontal posture of almost all dinosaurs. Which seems a little odd. No, what seems odd is that a grown man presenting himself as a science educator apparently doesn't know the basics of dinosaur anatomy, despite acting like he does. Or they're being, the footprints are being deposited in water and the tails are being suspended by the water. I think the evidence is for the latter. Then they would have had to have been lighter than water. But we have no reason to think that they were. We have dinosaur tails preserved with the remains of soft tissue as impressions. They weren't fatty, they were full of bone, ligament, and muscle. Dinosaur tails would have been at best only lightly buoyant and probably would have been negatively buoyant, and so would have sunk. There's no reason to expect tail drags to be common for dinosaur tracks in the first place, and no reason to think that only being in water prevents this. Once again, why is this just begging the question? Uh, which suggests that most dinosaur prints are actually made underwater. It does nothing of the sort. And I like how he shows us a picture of Coelophysis definitely not dragging its tail. 
Furthermore, a second observation with footprints is when you find a given organism in the fossil record, typically you'll find his footprints before you find his body fossils, before you find his bones or before you find his shells. For example, when you first find trilobites in the fossil record at the base of the Cambrian, the very oldest rocks that contain animal fossils, you don't find the shells of the trilobites, you find the footprints, what's called Cruziana. In the lower left there, we have a picture of Cruziana footprints. They're the, the little trackways that the little guys make. You have to go up the stratigraphic column some distance, in some cases um, several dozens of feet, to finally get the first uh, shells. And these shells are made of calcium carbonate. I mean, these shells are pretty, pretty solid. They're made of limestone. Trilobites show up in body fossils in stage 3 of the Cambrian, so about 520 million years ago, give or take. The first Cruziana ichnofossils do indeed predate that significantly, but the problem is that Cruziana aren't only made by trilobites. They're also made by other organisms like some worms that have limbs. So on its own, Cruziana is a bad way to detect the presence of trilobites unless other impressions or body fossils are found. It should be easy to preserve them if they were there. It is, and they probably weren't. And Cruziana on its own is insufficient to determine if trilobites are present. Yet, what we have are footprints that occur for a number of layers before we finally get the bodies. That's a big old citation needed for me. Same thing happens with the dinosaurs. The very oldest evidence we have of dinosaurs are footprints. It isn't until later that we get the bones. Now, this claim actually has some merit. There might be as much as 12 million years between the first dinosaur tracks and the first body fossils of dinosaurs. But there's a difference here between trilobites and dinosaurs. Trilobites are basically fossil factories. Their shells were calcified, and so were basically rock. And they shed their shells many times during a lifetime. So each shed can produce a new fossil, potentially. That's why their fossils are so abundant that you can buy them at a rock shop for like a buck. Dinosaurs don't shed their bones. And their bones are less solid than trilobite shell anyway. And so we're already less likely to fossilize. Additionally, marine creatures like trilobites tended to live exactly where fossilization is most likely, at the bottom of sediment-filled, usually shallow seas. The first dinosaurs lived in Pangaea, which was basically a desert with low rates of sedimentation because the land was so vast that not much precipitation or even wind made it to the interior. Basically the worst place for fossils. Not that we don't have Triassic fossils. We do. It's just that they usually tend to be in places like modern Arizona and New Mexico that were on the coast of Pangaea. But another thing is that over a dinosaur's lifetime, it can leave millions of footprints, but only one skeleton. So it's honestly not surprising that far more numerous footprints are found before the vastly less numerous skeletons. But also, I don't know if this trend is actually found in a wide range of organisms. Kurt has only mentioned trilobites and dinosaurs, and he's probably wrong about one. So at best we can say dinosaur tracks predate dinosaur body fossils, and that's it. To say that this is a trend, he would have to show good evidence of this happening elsewhere in the supposed flood rocks. It would seem, in the face of it, that it would be easier to preserve bones than it would be to preserve footprints, but the fossil record shows footprints before bones. I would suggest that what this is uh, referring to is that uh, organisms are escaping from a catastrophe. They're running for their life while uh, sedimentation is occurring very rapidly, so you see their escape trackways before you finally get their bodies at a, a, a higher level. Except that that kind of rapid sedimentation wouldn't preserve ichnofossils at all. So that can't be what happened. And this whole argument is a non-starter, even if it be true that the tracks of organisms are consistently found below their body fossils. So the footprints that are formed underwater and formed before the uh, body fossils suggest that we have both terrestrial and marine organisms overwhelmed by this catastrophe, which is consistent with the global flood we have mentioned in scripture. It would be if those things were true and floods didn't destroy trace fossils like footprints and burrows. Another issue is the issue of disparity before diversity and stasis before abrupt appearance. The difference between disparity and diversity. Diversity is the number of organisms that you have. It's how many different species you have. Disparity is how different those species are. In an evolutionary perspective of things, uh, organisms uh, 
in fact, change through time according to an evolutionary tree. They, new species come in slightly different than species that were already there, gradually branching out, gradually becoming more and more different from the original species. Remember, that's part of the AIG narrative too, because they fully accept evolution as a process that produced the species within what they imagine to be separate kinds. So in order to create great disparity or difference among and between organisms, you have to actually branch a number of times before you can get there. Nope, that's how you create diversity, that is, large numbers of species. A single species can evolve significantly without ever branching into a new species if there is consistent directional selection and the population never have the opportunity to found new populations that then form new species. For example, it is likely that the three species of the genus Thalassochnus, or the aquatic sloths, are in fact what is known as a chrono species. That is, they represent the same population evolving through time rather than splitting into new species that may coexist. Now, branching usually does come with changing morphology at the same time, but the two things do not have to be related, even if they often are. On the way, you're increasing the number of species. So it should be that you cannot produce, in evolutionary theory, great disparity before you've already produced great diversity. Uh, no. <laughs> So as Stephen Jay Gould and others have said, with evolution you would expect diversity to appear before disparity in the fossil record, but alas, what fossils show over and over again is high disparity at the beginning, long before we get any diversity. Well, you can't have any disparity without some diversity, because in order to have disparity, you have to have more than one species, and that right there is diversity. For example, the oldest um, uh, arthropods, some of the oldest arthropods in the world, are found in the Burgess Shale. Beautiful preservation, so, so well preserved that you can actually dissect the individuals uh, as fossils with their internal parts. It's just extraordinary stuff. It is extraordinary, and it's also well understood how it happened. And while the sedimentation of the shale can be described as rapid, it is not described as catastrophically deposited in any works by actual scientists that I can find. I have, however, linked the most cited work on the preservation of the Burgess Shale fossils I could find, Mechanisms for Burgess Shale Type Preservation by Robert R. Gaines et al. In the Burgess Shale, if you set aside the trilobites, there are 21 species of arthropods that, are, that have been described and they represent 20 different classes of the phylum arthropoda. So the major groups of arthropods, that's the highest classification of arthropods, at the first, basically the first level that you find arthropods at all, you find 20 different classes. There are only five classes of arthropods in the present. Ah, but you see, in the Cambrian, a class didn't mean what it would mean now. So arthropoda is a phylum, and it depends on how you count, but it is generally thought to have under it groupings of various ranks, including subphyla, superclasses, and classes, the number of which is in fact a bit up for debate, as what a class is is fundamentally arbitrary. But let's take a look at some very different arthropods around today, the spider and the bumblebee. In terms of evolutionary biology, current estimates say that these two shared a common ancestor about 520 million years ago, and so are quite distinct. Now the bumblebee is a mandibulate, while the spider is a chelicerate, which is the deepest divide in crown arthropods. So let's take a look at the base of this tree, with the ancient crustacean Cascalus ravitis. It was about 430 million years old, and this is Sanctacaris uncata, a chelicerate. It's about 500 million years old, so about 70 million years between them, and about 90 million years from the common ancestor of the two to the younger of them, C. ravitis. They look fairly similar, and with good reason, they're more closely related than a modern spider and a bumblebee are, even though their common ancestor with each other is the same as the common ancestor of the bee and the spider. If you wanted to see two modern arthropods that are about as related as C. Gravitis and S. Uncata, you could look at the red fire ant, Solenopsis invecta, and the electric ant, or little fire ant, Wasmania oropunctata. And that's right, both of them are ants. Both are even fire ants, in fact, they're in the same subfamily, Myrmicinae. It's only because now, hundreds of millions of years later, chelicerates and mandibulates have changed so much that we see them as radically different. In the actual Cambrian, the diversity was not anomalous, 
And if you looked at the chalicerates and mandibulates 400 million years ago, you might even put them in the same family. That's 120 million years after their common ancestor, which is about how long ants have been around. And they're all in one family. In fact, the only reason we can put these in different subphyla at all is because of what we know about their evolution. Without that information, Wise here wouldn't see that big difference that he imagines on the basis of modern examples of these groups. Once again, you scratch the surface of this claim just a little, and it stops making sense almost immediately. And there's only 21 species representing 20 different classes. That's huge disparity. That's more disparity than you in fact have in the present arthropods, and they're represented by only one more species than there is a disparity. Except that no, it's not. Because we're talking about so long ago, any splits in the family tree will look huge to us now. In fact, let's use a tree as an analogy. This tree's trunk split early on, and now two massive trunks grow from that point, each further splitting into other branches, subbranches, twigs, and finally leaves. This might seem like a big difference to you now, for a leaf to be connected to one trunk or the other. But think about when the split happened. It was probably the first split in the tree's life, and it was probably a very small tree. At that point, it was just a tiny little division at the top of a small plant. No big deal. It's only now, after probably decades, that it seems like such a major division in the tree. It's the same with evolution. Right after groups split, there's barely any difference at all, even if the now split groups go on to found what we now call classes. Right there at the base, there were sister species, as related to each other as wolves and coyotes, or bobcats and lynxes. That is not what you'd expect in evolutionary theory. No, it's exactly what we'd expect in evolutionary theory. We should see, early on, the emergence of what today are widely separated groups. What other option would there be? If evolution were true, should new groups just not evolve? That's basically the opposite of evolution. The problem is that Wise is confusing disparity as we see it today with disparity as it was in the same groups when they first started evolving. It's a bait and switch game. He then goes on to say the same thing about echinoderms as he just did about arthropods. I'm not going to repeat myself because my counter is literally the same, so I'm skipping that bit. But I would suggest that the observation of disparity before diversity fits a flood account because if the flood is coming in and, let's say, picking up entire ecosystems and carrying them and burying them... Which we know it couldn't have, but that's okay. When it picks up an ecosystem, the ecosystem has a very high dis disparity. It has trees, let's say it's a, a, a terrestrial ecosystem. It has trees and it has, uh, it has insects and it has, let's say, mammals and it's got fish in the little streams and it's got bacteria and it's got, it's got a very high disparity. Compared to the diversity of the world, it's got a very low div dis diversity. So it's got very high div disparity, the full disparity of life, and yet a relatively low diversity. Oh, all those things that are way more disparate than his examples of arthropods and echinoderms from the Cambrian. It's almost like we're seeing exactly what we'd expect if evolution were true. But if the flood is picking up animals and dumping them in sediment, like he says, then where's that Cambrian bunny? Also, why aren't fossils graded by hydrological means? Shouldn't the bitty trilobites sink slower than big lumbering bears? And why shouldn't tiny little Agnurignathus have managed to fly around with the birds found in the upper layers? Instead, it's gone by the Cretaceous, but birds are there? What happened? So if the flood picked up a community and dumped it in place, the first community it laid in would in fact have very high disparity with relatively low diversity. It's exactly what the fossil record shows. On the issue of organismal change, evolution, in fact, uh, predicts gradual change of one organism to another. So if your A is going to evolve into B and C, you would expect a series of transitions between A and B and A and C. And it would expect that the divergence could be seen between B and C as things go up in the, in the fossil record. What fossils actually show, though, is not this gradual change in divergence. Fossils show stasis and abrupt appearance, as Stephen Jay Gould used to describe it. Around the species level, sure, they usually do, but I've already talked about great fossil sequences for aquatic sloths and ceratopsians, but how about the sequence for horses, whales, or humans? Those show nicely smooth morphological change as you go up in the rocks forward in time, and closer to the modern members of those groups. Now, you might object that those are post-flood, 
But hey, if horses can evolve that much after the flood, I don't see why animals in the past couldn't either, whether we have the intermediate forms or not. And, of course, the Ceratopsians aren't post-flood, nor are they the only fossil sequence we have. It's just that they're a particularly flashy and complete one, and I like dinosaurs. Uh, stasis means that when you find a particular species in the record at one level, the first, the oldest one you've got, it stays the same. You find the same species throughout its entire range, and then it disappears. You don't find the species changing at all. Uh, it is in stasis. Couple things. Let's introduce to the channel, once again, stabilizing selection. When a species is about as fit as it reasonably can be in an environment, then of course that means that any significant change is going to be harmful. So natural selection acts to keep a species morphologically stable over time. But we also have examples of species indeed changing under the influence of directional selection. For example, bison antiquus was the direct ancestor of bison bison. The black vulture has fossil forms that were larger and had different beak shapes as you go into the past. Similarly, the species of condor in the fossil record are probably chronospecies. Now, why is there a bias towards recent groups when looking for these smooth transitions? Is it because evolution was different in the past? Well, probably not. As I've already mentioned in this series, older ages are going to have a smaller percentage of the rocks that formed at the time still around because erosion is a thing and always has been. Further, while smooth transitions over tens of thousands to millions of years do happen, Gould was at least somewhat right that punctuated equilibrium is correct. You see, while the majority of a population of organisms may stay in the environment to which they are well adapted, sometimes smaller breakaway populations may enter new environments, or changes to an environment, such as a new mountain range or river, may break a segment of the population off. This new segment is going to be heavily affected by not only new selection pressures, but also the founder effect and genetic drift. The founder effect is simply that if you take a small segment of a large population, their genetic diversity as a group will not be the same statistically as that of the larger population. Genetic drift is the non-selection change in allele frequencies just to do with random chance. Basically, which chromosomes just happen to end up in the particular sperm and egg that go on to make a new individual. Or it can also be the result of relatively random events that call part of the population. So for instance, if you have flowers, it might just so happen that a wildflower kills more of the blue flowers than the red flowers, just by chance. Next generation is going to have more red flowers. Combined, this means that even without changes in the selection, the daughter population will look significantly different from the parent population after a while. Taken together, this small population is likely to change relatively rapidly until they are reasonably well adapted to their new habitat. In the fossil record, this would look like the stable existence of the parent population, and then at some point the sudden appearance of a similar but distinct species without a smooth transition between them, because the transition was swift and only a small percentage of animals are ever fossilized, and then the fossils survive and are found. That is why at the species level, transitional fossils are rare, but not unheard of, while at larger levels they are actually quite common. In fact, here's a bunch of them again. <laughs> And when you first find the species, there's no transition evident in the fossils from any other species. Except, you know, when there is. So it's sudden appearance and then stasis through time. And it's not just true of species, as Stephen Jay Gould argued, it's actually also true of every taxonomic uh, level. Oh cool, except we already saw it wasn't true for the family Equidae, the suborder Ceratopsia, and the phylum Arthropoda. I guess Dr. Wise is just lying to us. But hey, 
Look at the unranked clade Pantestudines, which is basically the stem and crown root of turtles. There is Unotosaurus, then later we find Odontokelis, and still later Proganokelis. And even later there's Ningemis, which is still not a crown turtle. Now I would say this is certainly not something predicted by evolutionary theory, but it is expected by a, with a flood. Okay, so evolution predicts that we should find transitional forms at various taxonomic levels. A flood predicts that we should not. I have already shown numerous transitional fossils, but you know, here's the slideshow again. So I guess that's the flood falsified. Of course, Dr. Wise will come up with some post hoc reason to reject literally anything as transitional unless it's in the Cenozoic, but that's because you gotta lie to Gek. Or just not know. Because if in fact you have a world already full of organisms, and you, you uh, take that world and dump it into the fossil record, every time the fossil record in that sense has sampled from the world, let's say it's sampling dogs, it comes and samples a dog and buries him here, and then samples, buries him here and here and here. Since it's all from the same species, because they all lived at the same time, sh they should not change up through the record. That's true, which is why it's weird that the first dogs we find are Hesperocyonids and not modern canines. But we also have Borophagines between the Hesperocyonids and the Holocene. Of course, there were literally no canids in the supposed flood record, which is odd, isn't it? Where do they live if they weren't preserved at all in flood layers? But they're all over the post-flood layers. Be that's, that would, you would expect stasis with a flood model. Also, what's the likelihood that the first time you picked up that dog, there would be any other fossils that had just been laid down that look like you're transitioning into a dog? That would be extremely improbable, if not impossible altogether. Well then, I guess since Meosis exists and it's transitioning into a dog and it's in the fossil record, that's another win for evolution. So, the disparity before diversity, the stasis and abrupt appearance, which is very common among organisms, suggests that we have what is called a global life assemblage. It's called that? By whom? Because when I searched for that phrase, literally zero results came up. I think the only person who calls it that is Kurt here. It's a living group of organisms, living communities, living, uh, living ecosystems and biomes across the world that are picked up suddenly in a flood and dumped and buried. So you've got the high disparity with low diversity from such a living assemblage. Except that, you know, we don't have oddly high disparity because Kurt Wise is presenting a straw man of how taxonomy works in the framework of evolutionary biology. Basically, this whole bit he's doing here comes down to, now you see, if I just pretend the fossil record isn't what it actually is, and that evolution doesn't work the way that it's thought to by scientists, then I can say it was a flood, and not deep time and evolution that caused the fossil record. And yes, if you say things that aren't true about the fossil record, you can reach a conclusion that also isn't true. You've got the uh, stasis and abrupt appearance uh, from, uh, from the same thing. So we have evidence of... Uh, so far, a uh, catastrophe, rapid burial. Catastrophes of various kinds, yes. A global, single, watery catastrophe? Absolutely not. That's precluded entirely by the data. Strong east-west current, global flood, and global life assemblage. Strong east-west flow? Nope. Chadwick's data do not support that conclusion. I've checked myself. 
Global Flood? Still a no. Global Life Assemblage is just a made up term that doesn't mean anything and isn't used by anyone else but wise as far as I can tell. Then we have evidence that the fossils make a gradual transition from low in the sequence to high in the sequence, from sea to land. But the weird thing is that the rocks don't. There are terrestrial rocks from the Precambrian and the Cambrian. Why is that if the Cambrian is actually just the flood burying the bottom of the ocean? Also, why are there marine sediments from the end of the Cretaceous, if that's just the flood getting the upland areas? Also, how does any of this square with the mammals being at the highest elevations, when basically the whole fossil record of modern type animals is after the flood? Why didn't the flood kill and preserve a single elephant, a single dog, a single bear, a single pig, a single monkey? What's up with that? Uh, this, um, the only way this can really be shown is if you create a, a, a tree of relationship of organisms. This is something I did a number of years ago to test whether the evolutionary claim was true that the evolutionary tree of organisms is uh, shown or proven by the fossil record. Well, it's not proven. Science doesn't do proof. But evolution is indeed seen in the fossil record. And the fossil record is also predicted by evolution. Basically, all paleontology digs that receive funding do so on the basis of using geology and evolutionary biology together to know where to look for what you want to find. Perhaps most famously, Tiktaalik was found in the Canadian Arctic specifically because of a prediction of evolution about the time frame and environment in which the first fish started to walk on limbs, like a tetrapod. But also, even the various early hominins that are being found and have been found in Africa were predicted to be there all the way back by Charles Darwin, who noticed that among all animals, humans were most similar to the African apes, like the gorilla and the chimpanzee. Creationism cannot make any such prediction. At best, it can accommodate the data after the fact. But that right there shows the absolute uselessness of creationism. Even if evolution weren't true and creationism were, evolution still manages to make useful predictions, and so the only reasonable thing to do in science is to keep using it and keep ignoring creationism. I had heard a number of my professors through time say the fossils show the order of evolution. What they meant was that in the evolutionary tree, the appearance, the order of branching that evolution says occurred is reflected in the order that those groups of organisms first appeared in the fossil record. That is broadly true for organisms with a good fossil record. Others we basically have no fossils of, like rotifers. So I set about to test that. In order to test it, you've got to first of all create the evolutionary tree. So I used the best uh, information that was available at the time to create an evolutionary tree of all organisms. In this case, I'm going to be looking just at the orders and above, uh, and this is part of that evolutionary tree, but this part down here called eukaryotic kingdoms, there's more to the tree that I can't fit on here. Yeah, and it's the part of the tree that's the easiest to make fossils of, since fossilization in most cases is easier for larger organisms. Nice that we're focusing our study in exactly the place where the data will be least reliable. So we look at that tree, and there's two more branches on that tree that I can't fit on here, so you need to stick the plants in there, and you need to stick the animals in there. So you got a very big tree. Okay, apologies to Dr. Wise. Apparently he is going to bother with animals and plants. Now once you've done that, you can then uh, look at this tree and determine, predict from it, what the order of branching should be. It should be that the tree started down here and made its way out to the final result, so I would expect that the first branches would be the Placozoa and the Periphera in this particular tree. Then we should get the um, Archaeocyathids, then we should get the Cnidarians, then you should get the Tenophores, and so on. And how did Dr. Wise account for taphonomic bias, which means that some organisms are far more likely to fossilize than others? For example, Tenophores, or cone jellies, are quite rare in the fossil record because they're made up of very thin layers of soft tissue, so we really don't expect to see much of a fossil record of them. The same goes for many of the later forming branches too, such as Rotifera, Nematoda, and Tardigrata, which also had the disadvantage of being quite small and so doubly unlikely to fossilize in most circumstances. I feel like we're not even going to find out. This tree allows us to predict an order of branching. When you do that and lay them all out, you find that actually the order of branching predicted by evolution from this tree doesn't really correspond with the order of branching that you find uh, in, uh, in the fossil record. 
or I should say with the order of first appearance in the fossil record. In other words, when evolution says this group should have come first, that's not usually the, the first group in the fossil record. See, here's the thing. Kurt didn't show his work. But let's be fair. This is just a lecture for lay folk. It's not for scientists or people like me who are willing to do the statistical analysis ourselves. So I went looking for Wise's numbers, and near as I can tell, they're not published anywhere. Google Scholar returns plenty of his work, as does the Answers Research Journal's internal search function, but near as I can tell, none of them are this analysis. And just based on what I know of the fossil record, this result seems absurd on its face. So until Kurt bothers to show his data that he used to generate this result, there is no reason anyone should take it seriously. It's just an empty claim that he accompanied by meaningless numbers, because even this data table is meaningless without labels and an explanation. Until he shows his work, this is just him saying, Look, evolution is wrong because I put numbers in a grid. And so 95% of the time, you can't reject a random order of first appearance in the fossil record. It's not consistent with evolutionary theory. Maybe, but sure would be cool if he showed his work and explained how it is that people routinely use evolutionary biology to find new fossils. So really, there's nothing to explain in the fossil record. It looks like randomness, uh, except for except for the fact that the 5% that does seem to correspond happens to be in groups where evolution says this group evolved from sea to land. So for example, it says that the plants evolved from the sea to land, and the plant groups seem to come into the, into the fossil record in the same order that evolution says it, they should. Ah, which is also conveniently the bits that Kurt Wise thinks he can explain. Weird that his alleged data just happened to be so convenient for him, despite the fact that he won't show them publicly. Uh, the land animals are thought to have evolved from the sea, and they come in in the order that evolution predicts they should come in. So it appears that there's evidence, for the most part, of randomness, but the only pattern that really has to be explained is a sea-to-land transition, which is what I'd expect with a flood. Are we supposed to be impressed that when he won't show his work, it supports him, even though he came to his conclusion before doing the work? Seriously, this is like if you wanted to build a bridge and an architect came to you with a design for a fantastical bridge that looks really awesome, but in no way looks like it would hold up under its own weight, never mind the weight of traffic. So you ask to see his math, and he just shows you a table of numbers with statistical labels that don't really say anything because they're otherwise unlabeled. So you ask if you can see all of his calculations, and he just says, no, you can't. But really, these numbers are fantastic and totally support my conclusion that this bridge is sound. Is that the architect you're going to hire? I doubt it. A flood, in fact, buries things in the ocean first, and then eventually transgresses onto the land, taking things off of the land. I've already explained ad nauseum why that explanation doesn't actually work. Just watch earlier in this series for more of that. This can be tested as a matter of fact, I became interested in one of those groups that seems to correspond between, uh, between evolution and the order in the fossil record, and that's the classes of plants. And here's the list of those, most of them you're probably not at all familiar with, because most of them are in fact uh, uh, extinct. The last one down there, Magnolia phyta, uh, refers to the flowering plants, which, is mo which are most of the plants of the world, the 250,000 flowering plants of the world. Uh, you got cycads and, and the um, uh, conifers in there, but most of these others are in fact extinct groups. I really feel like we need a point here. This is the order of branching predicted by evolution. Uh, and you can put numbers on these things. Uh, this is the actual order of first appearance, or actually when these groups come in in the fossil record. Again, looking at rocks from the bottom to the top, the bottom rocks being the oldest, the um, upper rocks being the youngest. That chart is a bunch of visual noise. Just display them as separate columns of varying width to show a diversity at the given period. Why stack them horizontally like that? It's just ugly, and then they're all colored green. It's not obvious which section of the curve corresponds to which label. Just from a data presentation standpoint, this is trash. Uh, we start out with very, and the width of this, uh, this thing in the, on the screen would in fact be how many species, how many groups, uh, how many individual, not individuals, yeah, how many species there are of a particular group. So at the very first, the fossil plants are represented by only a single species. 
with time the number of plants increases. That already doesn't make sense for a flood. What ecosystem does Dr. Wise imagine could be the one with only one plant species in a world where the full diversity of plants that have ever existed exists simultaneously? The only reason that works in terms of evolution is that when you're the first species of a taxon to colonize a new habitat, you're going to be the only species in your taxon there. So when plants first colonize the land, that one species is the only one there. But they wouldn't have made it if they had had to compete with all sorts of things like switchgrass and salt warts, which were already better at water transport and tolerant of the salty areas the first plants in. They couldn't have made it. This is absolutely insane here. And then how many of those plants are in each of the groups is indicated here. And from this, we can see in the fossil record what order these groups first appeared in. You can compare the order predicted by evolution with the order predicted uh, by or shown by the fossil record, and you find a tremendous correspondence. It's 99% of the pattern can be explained by evolution, or putting it another way, the plants do seem to come into the fossil record in the same order as evolution. However, in addition to looking at it from an evolutionary perspective, you could also ask a different question. What order would you predict them to come in if you arrange them from sea to land? Well, since it would be based on how close to the ocean we find the plants, with the ones near shore being found first, I'd expect Horneophytopsida, Equidistopsida, Lacerophilopsida, Lycopsida, Psychodopsida, Ag Magniophyta first all in a group then the last three persisting all the way through the fossil record, then I'd expect the rest, that is, Agalophyton, Rhenopsida, Pilocopsida, Progymnospermopsida, Teriotosperms, Pinopsida, and Netopsida, to be starting somewhere in like the Permian or Triassic, and then persisting. Weird how that's not at all what we find, even according to Wise. And note, I'm using his names. There are other terms for some of these groups, but I want it to be easy to compare. The thing is that most of these groups aren't well described by their favorite altitude, and members of them have both lowland and highland members, and even coastal members. Go to the swamps of Florida or the bayou, and let me know if you can find some coastal magnolia fights. The place will be covered with them. What if you considered the plants that have to have standing water to reproduce at one end of the spectrum? You mean like some magnolia fights, such as bog plants like the Venus flytrap? Okay, but... They're the last to appear in the fossil record. Must have been all those mountain bogs I hear so much about. And then put them side by side as per how much water they need to survive, all the way up to animals that can survive even in, let's say, desert environments. It, <clears throat> when you put them in a, an order of what might be called terrestriality, from non-terrestrial to terrestrial, you get a pattern like you have at the right. Now the pattern at the right looks very similar to the pattern at the left. Uh, extremely similar. Uh, it's not quite the same. Except you don't, because there's internal diversity in how terrestrial members of these groups are. There are straight up aquatic magnolia fights. Lotuses are aquatic, water lilies are aquatic, rice is aquatic, water chestnuts are aquatic, watercress is aquatic, hornworts are aquatic, and skunk cabbage is semi-aquatic. All magnolia fights. Kurt, I don't believe that you've never heard of any of these plants. I bet you've eaten some of them. This is just dumb beyond belief. I am officially at the point of having trouble believing that Kurt Wise doesn't know that aquatic magnolia fights exist, and this is coming into the territory where I suspect he knows he's wrong and doesn't care. But from this, you can then predict a pattern of branching that evolution would predict and a pattern of branching that ecology would predict if these things were arranged from sea to land. Okay, Kurt, where are my Silurian or Carboniferous water lilies, huh, Kurt? Seriously, any thought about this at all? And it just falls apart. Plus, even on his own terms, this is wrong. He has Philocopsida and Equistopsida on the same level, that is the fern and horsetails, but horsetails need wetlands and ferns grow all over forests that are by no means wetlands. In other words, ferns are considerably more terrestrial than horsetails, so they should come after, but instead he has them coming into the fossil record at the same time. And you can compare those and do another uh do more statistics, you basically get the same pattern. In other words, evolution can predict the pattern, but also another thing that could have produced the pattern is if the plants were actually lined up from sea to land with uh, increasing terrestriality. Still waiting on that Silurian water cabbage. I feel like I'm gonna have to keep waiting. Also, why does he have seed ferns as extant? 
there are no known extant seed ferns. Also, I feel like gymnosperms aren't extinct because, you know, that's basically pine trees, and I think they're still around. But not according to this chart. I'm also confused by the idea that there are lycopod trees still on Earth. Maybe this chart isn't supposed to go to present, which, you know, is why you label your axes. But even if it's not, then why does it show pine trees as being extinct? Is there anything that makes sense of that? Well, I conceived of a theory a number of years ago to, to in fact explain that because of my experience once on a floating bog, on a uh, quaking bog. Quaking bogs are cool, but you know what else they are? Really fragile in anything approaching strong winds. They can just break off, and that's in inland wetlands. Never mind the coast of an ocean where the strongest storms occur. Well, take a look at this. That is a massive bog that broke away from shore and is now floating around a lake near Brainerd. The DNR says it believes the high water level, along with high winds, caused the bog to break free. The crumbs of smashed docks are now part of the traveling bog. This is the damage left behind. And don't give me, there were no pre-flood storms. Storms are an inevitable outcome of thermodynamics and the chaotic nature of fluid flow. Oh, and other young earth creationists have also debunked this idea. But we'll get to that, I'm sure. One of these vegetation mats that grows out over a lake from the shore, uh, which is a wild experience, I realize that in that situation, the plants in the floating bog were arranged from the open water to the land in increasing terrestriality. That made sense. He said with no hint of irony, given that virtually all of the plants he saw were Magnolia phyta, but we don't find any of those aquatic Magnolia phytes early in the fossil record. The, tr the plants that were growing out over the water, they needed water. They lived in, con lived in water continuously. The plants that were on the shore didn't need that much water. So they were arranged in a water to land, increasing terrestriality order. Does this mean that the corollary is that we shouldn't find aquatic plants late in the flood layers? If so, then that's another problem, because Montesquieu vidali is a Cretaceous aquatic angiosperm. In fact, if ecological zonation is the solution to the succession of paleofauna in the fossil record, then why do we even have ocean fish in the Cretaceous? Shouldn't the flood be hitting mountains and such? Why are there Cretaceous sea turtles and sharks? Were four meter long sea turtles swimming through mountain streams? And so I thought, well, maybe these plants in the fossil record were arranged in the same way. What if they actually represent a floating forest, like a quaking bog? Well, I think it goes without saying, no one in real science takes this idea seriously, as there's no evidence that really supports it. But let's take a look at what other creationists say. We're going to take a look at sinking the floating forest hypothesis by Tim Clary and Jeffrey Tompkins, because why bother with science when even other pseudoscientists can call out your nonsense? Well, in that write-up, Clary and Tompkins lay out a series of criteria for determining if fossil trees are preserved in situ, that is, in the place where they grew without transport during the deposition of the matrix in which they're preserved. These criteria are, one, multiple single-species trees spaced in growth positions in the same horizontal plane, spaced equidistantly in all directions from the trunks as you would find in a living forest and not merely randomly spaced. Two, multiple trees in the same rock layer or along a common surface. Three, trees with root systems that cross-cut bedding layers. Four, evidence of rapid burial by thick sediment and water. Five, a lack of sedimentary rock layers underneath the trees. Six, no bowing or distortion of any sedimentary layers beneath the tree stumps. Seven, accompanying vegetation that also cross-cut the same layers as the lycopod tree stumps. I think there are a couple problems here. For example, bogs are areas of fairly rapid deposition, so I don't think that the requirement for multiple trees to be along a common surface or a horizontal plane is really necessary, nor is four well-defined. Is normal bog deposition rapid enough? I don't know. Similarly, six really isn't necessary since post-lithification bending is a thing that occurs. But either way, all of these are reasons why they're too restrictive in identifying in situ forests. And that doesn't really matter to their point, because they did in fact find a fossil forest from the Carboniferous system of rocks that meets their criteria. Which means, I would also agree, that it is an in situ forest preserved in the fossil record. The site is in Glasgow, Scotland, and was discovered in a rock quarry outside the city proper. Given the preserved soil horizons and in situ networks, and as Clarion Tompkins point out, the fact that Wise is simply wrong that lycopod trees had hollow trunks and roots, in fact they were not hollow at all, all of this adds up to say, when even other creationists aren't buying it, it's time to go back to the drawing board. So I reconstructed a forest by basically taking the order in the fossil record, 
and then, and then bringing it straight up to draw a picture of this floating forest. I propose that there was a floating forest on the pre-flood world's oceans that's the size of a continent, very large. I mean, the size of North America, for example. It's huge. And I say that it's large like that because the main trees of this, in fact, produce the coals of the eastern United States, Europe, and Asia. That's a lot of coal. No one has coal forests on the ocean like antediluvian Earth. They're huge. Best coal forests you've ever seen. In fact, many people, they tell me, gee, we've never seen coal forests this awesome. And believe me, I know it. I mean, these things are tremendous. That's a lot of forest, so we have to propose a very large forest to explain it. This, um, in this particular theory, this floating forest would have existed in the world before the flood, would have floated on the oceans before the flood, would have been quite fine until it came to the flood. When the flood came along, waves would tend to break up this forest, and they'd break it up from the outside of the forest towards the middle. Do you think Kurt knows that waves happen without global floods? I mean, the ocean is full of waves and wind, and that's what breaks up quaking bogs. Does he have a model for how the ocean managed to not have strong winds or waves before the flood? Did the atmosphere just not have convection cells? Because that's what drives winds and waves usually, and that would be more than sufficient to break up such a floating forest. And so the first things that would be, would be torn off and buried would be the organisms at the edge of the forest, and then it would work its way in towards the center of the forest. This would actually explain the order of appearance of the major groups of plants. Except for the fact that all later groups of plants have aquatic members specifically in the kind of boggy environment he's talking about, including salty areas like sedgegrass. Sedgegrass would have loved that place, yet it is not apparent in the fossil record in times like the Devonian, Silurian, or Carboniferous. Uh, which is what I was interested in, in the first place. It also means that if you looked at the organisms, the plants that were buried at the bottom, it's like you were looking at the edge of this floating forest. So if you go into a, um, a museum and you see a diorama for the early Devonian, that'd be in pretty old rocks with, with uh, uh, plants in them, this is going to illustrate several plants like uh, zostrophyllites and uh, uh, rhineophytes and so on. But this is basically a picture not of a particular time in Earth history before the rest of the plants. Rather, it's the edge of the floating forest looking out to sea. Ignore the mountains in the background. And you've got a picture of the edge of the floating forest. So we know that in modern wetlands, things like lizards, flies, water striders, caddisflies, etc. thrive. Where were they in the Devonian? Why not a single lizard, fly, water strider, or caddisfly? Do they only live in upland swamps? What kept them out of the floating bogs? And don't say salt tolerance, because if things like silverfish, tetrapods, and scorpions can adapt to salt there, what makes water striders special that they can't? Especially since, you know, Halobates is a thing, a genus of water striders with some 40 species that are seagoing. That is, they live on the surface of the actual ocean. After this, he repeated himself about how different time periods in his mind map onto different distances from the edge of his imaginary forests. We're skipping that. So a floating forest theory explains the increasing terrestriality of plants in the fossil record. But it explains another thing, too. I realized that in the floating bogs that I had been on, the plants that grow out over the water were very small plants. Whereas as you get further and further away from the water towards the shore, the plants get progressively taller. So there's actually an increase in size corresponding to the increase in terrestriality in modern quaking bogs. Sure, but since this is a prediction of both evolution and quaking bogs, I'm not sure why it matters. But there's also an increase in size corresponding to, this, to the increase in terrestriality in the fossil record. So the floating forest theory explains both of those. Plus, I guess, yeah, sure, but it needs to explain all the data. And it really doesn't. Even other creationists know it. It explains the fact that most of these fossil plants are extinct or near extinct. Only if you make the assumption that such plants can only grow on floating vegetative mass. 
which there's no reason to assume, especially since modern analogs of quaking bogs are not made up of distinct assemblages of flora, but rather the same species that are growing on land. And it makes sense because if in fact there was a floating forest before the flood, and the flood destroyed that floating forest, it's unlikely that the floating forest would ever be able to regrow on the rough oceans following the flood. How did it grow on rough oceans before the flood? Just magic? It's magic, isn't it? God could have created the floating forest in place, and it would be quite happy until the flood. But once you have destroyed it, and you now have winds and choppy seas following the flood, I don't see any way in which that floating forest could regrow. Yep. It was magic. I am shocked. Shocked. Well, not that shocked. That would, ex that would mean that the plants of the floating forest would, ha would, would, ha would be hard-pressed to find an ecosystem where they could live. Because their ecosystem, the one they were designed for, has been destroyed. Oh, so organisms tend to go extinct after their ecosystem is destroyed. That didn't happen to basically everything during the flood? There should be essentially nothing alive after that, because guess what? You can't reestablish bogs, fens, forests, jungles, savannas, etc. after a global flood salts the earth and kills virtually all plants and even more of the animals. The other observation that is consistent with this the these theory, and something I was always bothered by when I saw the fossil plants myself through the years, is that many of these plants are actually preserved in marine sediments. Since not even other creationists agree with that, I'm going to need a citation on that one. Also, if the whole Paleozoic and Mesozoic are just a result of a single flood, what does that even mean for sediments to be marine versus terrestrial? It's all just the ocean rising. Shouldn't everything be marine? And if so, then you can't point out that Devonian or Silurian plants are in marine sediments as if the Cretaceous ones aren't. Even if really they're not, because according to the flood model, they should all be in marine turbidites. Of course, the fact that they're not is direct disconfirmation of the flood in the first place, so the whole talk is moot, but oh well. They're not found in terrestrial sediments, the sediments on the land, they were, they were found in marine sediments, sometimes intermixed with uh, other fossils that would indicate a, a marine situation. Like what? Is there a shark or a sea star in a carboniferous coal forest? I'd sure like to see that. Perhaps we could be given an example of an obviously marine organism in, say, the fossil grove of Scotland or the petrified forests of Arizona and New Mexico. So I used to ask my professors, well, how is it that this particular fossil ends up in a marine environment? He says, well, it floats down the river and ends up you know, being deposited out there in the ocean, uh, being carried there by the, by the rivers. Oh, so not actual evident forests, just bits of plants and marine sediments. And here I thought we were talking about coal beds and the like. The, the problem there is that, that the, in the marine realm, those, micro, those organisms at the bottom of the ocean do a very good job of destroying whatever comes down the, uh, the streams. Uh, we just don't find fossils like that in those kinds of environments. Evidently, we do, because Kurt just said that we do. So I don't know what to tell you, except he's just contradicting himself. This theory, however, says that the reason we find these plants in marine rocks is because it was a marine ecosystem. It floated above the marine realm, and when it was destroyed, it was destroyed and buried in the marine realm. So it explains why, in fact, they're found in marine rocks. Well, that's great, except, you know, there's no evidence for it, and it makes predictions that have already failed, like what plants and animals should actually be there. And I'll keep pointing out that there is no reason members of extant taxa, such as lizards and sedge, shouldn't be there, and Wise hasn't even begun to explain why they're not. Another thing that it explains, though, is the fact that uh, some of these plants are actually very strange. If you look at a cross-section of the trees found in the center of this floating forest, in other words, the trees of the, uh, of the coal forest, you find that they're basically hollow. Now, technically, they're not hollow as in air in them, they have arenchymous tissue in the, in the center of it, which means they have a very light, um, thin tissue that has as its purpose carrying air. But there are cells and cell tissues in there to facilitate that. Most of the structure, most of the weight of the tree is held up by bark, successive layers of bark and not what we're used to in the center of trees, which is called secondary wood. There's no secondary wood in these things. 
They're basically hollow or airy tissues in the center of the, uh, of, of the stems. Here, let's just quote Cleary and Tompkins on this one. Another line of reasoning put forth in support of the floating forest hypothesis is that the arborescent lycopods were hollow in both their main aerial trunks and in their roots, a contention based primarily on speculation and not soundly supported by the scientific literature. The majority of the hollow tree studies do not take into account a number of key reports describing the non-hollow internal structure of lycopods. Research has demonstrated that intact, non-decayed aerial stems of arborescent lycopods clearly indicate a contiguous tissue structure across the breadth of the stem, with the same general schema found in trunks and roots. And even the roots are what look like roots. They're technically not roots because of this feature. Uh, the roots are also hollow, which is an odd thought. How in the world does a plant put a hollow root into into soil. How does it force its way into soil and remain hollow? Well, ignoring the fact that they're not hollow, you do it by growing. Roots aren't tentacles that grow to full size above the soil and then have to push down into the soil in a single go. They grow there, and the tip of the hollow root isn't going to be itself hollow. So I don't see why this would be a problem, even if it were true. But of course it's not true, and as Clary and Tompkins know, these roots grew through actual bedding planes and through paleosols, which would be impossible in Wise's model. Uh, and it gets worse when you see that coming off of the roots or rhizomes are these are perpendicular to them are straw sized soft hollow structures that are coming off of the uh, off the roots the rootlets small soft rootlets that were preserved in situ even according to creationists after the forest was ripped apart by a flood okay yeah that checks out uh, they come off at 90 degrees to the main axis. They are hollow and they're clearly very soft. How in the world does that grow through soil? No idea. By not being soft or particularly hollow, because they're not. And again, they did grow through soil. A paleosol is a fossil soil, and those are evident in many of the locations where we find lycopod tree fossils. This isn't a thing we have to wonder about. It's right there. In fact, in the present world, we do have some plant, these are tree sized, but in the present world, we have plants that are hollow stemmed, hollow rooted, and have just exactly that kind of root, rootlet, where the rootlets come out from the main root at 90 degrees to, uh, to, the, to the primary root, and they're hollow. And all of those plants are themselves floating plants. Floating plants that conveniently weren't in these forests for, you know, no reason. It's like Kurt is trying to be as wrong as possible, and he's succeeding. Or does he just mean modern lycopods? I don't know. But modern lycopods don't all float, so who knows? And uh, back in 1981, Joachim Schevin in Germany proposed that these plants, just these plants, just the center plants of the what, I, what I'm calling the floating forest, in fact, floated. He proposed this. I didn't know about this when I, I proposed my theory of the floating forest. Uh, he had a number of years proposed this for just some of the trees, namely the, the large trees of the, uh, of the coal forest. Oh, so scientists already examined and discarded this idea. Good to know. And you know what? I'm done with it too. He just goes on and on about how floating forests make coal. But guess what? There's no reason to think that they were floating forests. So no matter how much he thinks he can explain coal, it doesn't matter. Because he hasn't done the work to show that they were floating forests in the first place. We'll talk about a few of the other things he mentions though, but not line by line. He's far too repetitive. So one thing he says is that there's no way to get such flat bedding without a floating forest. But coal forests are analogs to modern bogs, which are in fact quite flat. He also said that Steve Austin found most coal was made from bark. Even if true, that doesn't really help or harm the forest hypothesis. He also says that coal seams indicate that the continents were together, but the problem is that in some cases, they're from the interior of the supercontinent, such as the Appalachian coal beds. He also goes into alleged carbon dating, but in most cases, carbon dating is just done by beta decay measuring, and carbon-14 isn't the only thing that does that. But even when it's done by mass spectroscopy, the dates they get are just basically the oldest date you can get with carbon-14 and is essentially what you get if you do the test with the test chamber empty, because there's no way to completely evacuate the test chamber, so there will always be residual carbon-14, and that residual carbon-14 will give you a reading. Also, he says that animals like Acanthostega and Tiktaalik were especially created because other animals couldn't put their weight on the floating forest, 
The fact that humans can walk on quaking bogs is a direct refutation of this. He also seems to think that you can just measure the vertical size of a stratum and infer how long it took to deposit, but that's not true in the least. If that's not what he's saying, then the only other thing I can take from it is that he thinks that a stratum always was laid down continuously from when it starts to when the next layer starts up, but that's also not true. Deposition can halt and erosion start, and that's basically it. Those are the only new claims he makes. And yeah, I can't just keep doing a line by line when he's so repetitive and his last claims are some of the worst ones. But here is his closing. I believe that uh, the, uh, the, the fossils of the flood are in fact best explained by the flood. The processes responsible for the major features of the Earth's fossil record are a global sedimentation, Except there is no such global stratum. And remember, one should expect a flood to make essentially one big stratum, all of it turbidite. Deposition in water. Well, deposition by wind and falling ash through the air is well known throughout the fossil bearing strata, so we failed that one. Deposition by catastrophe. There are indeed rocks deposited catastrophically, but we have not been given reason to think that the ones that couldn't be were, and there are a lot of those. And in fact, destruction of everything on the planet, which is consistent with God's judgment of man's sin in the flood in the days of Noah. Except we have terrestrial organisms that go right through the supposed flood boundary without being destroyed. So it wasn't a destruction of everything. In fact, oddly enough, the discontinuity between the Cretaceous and the Paleogene is far less than that between the Permian and the Triassic. But anyway, that's it. That's the end of this whole thing. My goodness, it got boring even for me at the end there. I spared you from about 10 minutes of repetitive rambling about floating forests with no citations. You're welcome. Well, I hope to see you next time. If you liked this video, hit the like button. If you didn't, tell me why not in the comments and hit the dislike button. Either way, please do subscribe and hit the bell icon and turn on all notifications so you're always notified when I have new content. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. Thanks for watching, but before you go, I just want to say a special thank you to my channel members and my patrons, especially those pledging $20 or above. Bob Knob, Work in Progress, Benthoven, Cynically Skeptic, Denny5252, Ian Chen, Landon Knoll, Mavity Babity, McSpooks, Sphincter of Doom, The Venerable Veed, and Patrick Dennis. As you probably know, YouTube is a very volatile platform, and from month to month my income on the channel can swing wildly. But the people you see on screen are directly supporting so that I don't have to worry too much about that, and the channel can keep going as it is. And perhaps even improving. If you'd like to join this team, there are links below to join the channel or in the description to join the Patreon. The Patreon starts as low as $1 a month, and the channel memberships start as low as $1.99 a month. On Patreon, you can even get a discount for pledging annually. If you do decide to pledge, you'll get access to an exclusive Discord server just for channel supporters, as well as early access to all of my pre-recorded videos, often up to two months in advance. Higher tiers will unlock even better perks. Now, if an annual or monthly pledge isn't right for you, but you still want to support the channel, there is a merch store down in the description, as well as an Amazon wishlist, just for me. And if financial support isn't something you can or want to do, then if you still want to help out the channel, please just like and share these videos and make sure you comment on them. It really helps the channel out.